Well, uh, we can't be accused of uh, not having a balanced conference. Sam, it was a great pleasure to hear you speak. Um, it's going to be a pleasure to hear the next person speak as well, because even though I screwed up on the last introduction, <laughs> I'm not going to screw up this time. What's the name again? Tony. I'm only joking, I'm only joking. Could you welcome Tori Crispin? <laughs> also known as Magoo44. <laughs> Tori. Oh, sorry. Screwed up again. I'm in Ireland! <laughs> it's so exciting to be here, I can't, I can't tell you. I grew up in Chicago, there's a lot of Irish people in Chicago. We go nuts. They dye the, the Chicago River green on St. Paddy's Day. I mean, they're insane. So it's so fun to really be in Ireland. My son's come here twice, he's like, you're gonna love it. And it, it really is. Ireland's a fabulous place and I also, I want to welcome all of you. Thank you to all the anonymous guys who came it's, and ladies. It's just been fabulous. It's everybody. I mean, it's, this has been an amazing trip, hasn't it? It's just been terrific. And I want to thank, is John McGee here? Is he? Okay, well, anyway, I want to thank him and Sam and Pete very much. Jerry Armstrong, thank you for coming. Every, all the international SPs, stand up. Come on, I want to see who they are. Come on. Jerry. All right. Well, really, you're all international SPs. Come on. Woo! You're not SPs? Come on. These are the international SPs. Woo! They thought Ireland couldn't do it. We nailed them. All right, so anyway, now, anyway, thank you, all of you, for coming, and uh, most of you know my story. Does anybody not know my story here? Anyway, I was in, everybody knows my story. All right, so I was in 30 years. It's filmed, so just in case, just in case somebody doesn't know it, I always tell a little bit, in for 30 years, escaped out in about two weeks from now in 2000, right? I woke up, made 4,000 posts on the internet, met Andreas in Norway on the internet, woke up and left. And they chased me across the country and someone told me today at an interview, well, they chased you across the country? And I said, yes, they chased me across the country. The vice president was at LAX and then my husband was in Chicago, OSA came to Chicago and then the Tampa police got us out of the at Tampa Airport. So it was, it was intense. I did not believe in fair game until that happened. I really didn't. I was like, I stood up in court, wherever I went, it's been canceled, right? You guys, you know, people that I talk to, and I want to make this very clear, especially to most of the people in the world, I talk to people every day, and they say, well, you know what, I would never do that, because I'm a free speech advocate. And I'm like, neither would we. My father was a broadcaster for football. And he used to say, you know, everybody's a Monday morning quarterback because they, you know, the game's over, right? And it's like, you don't know what you would do. Academics have interviewed me because, look at your face. <laughs> I just saw his face. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell if he was yawning or not, but I guess that that's part of the face. Okay. Um, anyway, academics have interviewed me and said, people don't join cults, cults come and find you. And that's what happened to me. I was a hippie in San Francisco doing drugs. Got, yeah, I know, I don't look like it now, but I was. Got sick, was in the hospital, and these two kids from high school came in and gave me a Dianetics book. And from that, I went back to college, got ticked off at my dad in 1969 and hitchhiked from Chicago to Los Angeles to do Scientology. But back then, it was an applied philosophy. It wasn't really a religion. If they'd said a religion, I wouldn't have been interested. But it was an applied philosophy. So anyway, I went, joined the Sea Org. I have epilepsy. So I was on medication for it. In the Sea Org, I run out of my medication. 
And I say, well, I need to get some more medication, thinking it's going to be nothing. I mean, I need medication. It's epilepsy, right? And they route me down to this 18-year-old kid who says, I'm the MLO. And I said, what's that? And he goes, the medical liaison officer. And I'm like, ooh, okay. And he goes, all right, you have to get off your medicine. We're the top 10% of the planet, and we don't take medicine. <laughs> right. Unbelievable. So, and Hubbard had a thing that he'd written in Science of Survival in the chart of human evaluations that says anyone with a neurological illness or any homosexuals are 1.1, which to him, he said, was the most insidious tone level of all. Couldn't trust them. They're the covertly hostile people that are trying to stab you in the back. I'm a person, you're going to know if I'm pissed off. That's one thing, right? You know, anybody who knows me, if I, you know, I'm going to tell you how I feel. I'm not, so I'm not 1-1. One, one. I'm going to, you're going to know it, but. <laughs> so, true. So, it, it, you know, it's one of those things where they, they, that's one of their worst things. I think besides breaking up families, besides fair game, besides medical abuse, is judgment. Because they judge everyone. And you learn that system when you get in. Early on, you, you learn keeping Scientology working is on every single course. And part of that is you've got to follow the path if you're going to make it across the bridge to total freedom. You don't know that it's really a pier into a ditch. So you're, you know, following along, right? <laughs> it is. So you're following it along, right? You know, really trying to stick with it. It's a tricky, it's a tricky road. It really is. And now I forgot what I was saying. What was I saying? But right before that. The judgment. So they. So it's almost like. And correct me if you think I'm wrong. For anybody that's a, that was in Scientology, but it's almost like a matrix thing. Someone walks up, and within. A matter of seconds, you've got their tone level, which is what emotional thing, whether they're PTS or not, um, upset or downstat, you know, it's just all these like evaluations, and then you're in this little niche. Now, before that, I would have never, if somebody said that was going to happen, I'd be like, no way. Well, that's what I started with, was like people saying, I would never do that. But neither would we, neither would anyone. But that's a tricky thing. It's a very slow train of mind control. Slow. You know, I, I have an analogy of it. It's sort of like if I gave you, let's say I said to you, I need you to take, it's top secret, I need you to take this envelope, put it in, a, in, put it into the mailbox at 4 o'clock, but don't tell anybody, can't tell anybody. And I need you to take this box. But these are separate conversations. I need you to take this box at 5 o'clock and put it in that in mailbox. Don't tell anyone. So now you're both in your houses, you know, you've never talked to each other about it, and you're watching the news, and the mailbox blows up. And you have this thought, didn't I put an envelope in that? But then you immediately think, it couldn't be anything to do with Scientology. You know what I mean? Because you're so brainwashed, it's such a good thing. It couldn't be that, right? But that's kind of how they get all this stuff going, because it's little, slow things. So uh, anyway, so... I got in it to be an auditor, to be a counselor, to help people. But then they routed me out to get off my medicine. Basically, I started having really bad grand mal seizures. And my mother, thank God, stayed on it and said, they're going to kill you. And I said, no, no, Dianetics is going to fix it. She said, Dianetics is not going to fix it. So she kept calling me. I went out on a date one night. I was losing my short-term memory, as you can see. And uh, I can always demonstrate it to an audience because I can't remember what I'm talking about. And uh, she called me up and she goes, how was your date? And I said, what date? And she said, okay, that's it. So I'm going to tell you something. Either you're back on your medication today and your doctor calls me today and says so, or I am going to fly out there from Chicago and trust me, L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology will never forget your mom. <laughs> and I knew she could kick ass, so there you go. I was like, <laughs> she saved my life. So I fought them for 30 years on that, on medicine. And I won, 
in a sense, but they're still doing medical malpractice. I know they are. But it was an awful thing, and it was, but that's what got me kind of, because when I left the C organization, Harvard wrote me a letter. They, they said I owed, I don't know, $100,000 or something, a freeloader said, for six months of being in the C org. And I, I was pissed, and these chicks were saying, well, you owe us this money. And I said, I don't owe you money. You broke my contract, right? If anything, I could take you to court. So I said, I'm going to write to the one sane man I know, which I've, the only time I said that was I was talking to some skeptics, and they all just burst out laughing. because I said, L. Ron Hubbard, and they all just burst out laughing. <laughs> but anyway, I wrote to him, and I got a letter back from Hubbard saying, continue on up the line, you know, get your auditing, basically fix epilepsy, and we'll see you up the line. So that got me on this whole thing of, like, I have to fix me instead of helping other people. And in the meantime, what they do is they kind of find out what you can do. I grew up in a PR family, so they got me doing PR. I was in Clearwater, Florida. We'd moved there, and they said, we need to get rid of Richard Tenney. He's the city commissioner. So from that... I'm out talking to people, and he did get voted out of office. So from there, I went from nobody in OSA up to talk to Tori, she can handle it. And I, I did go to a lot of different things doing that, but I still didn't believe in fair game. I didn't. And then you guys know I, I ended up on the Internet. You know, it's so ironic because they're selling freedom, and they enslave people just like everybody today has talked about. They sell communication, but they cut off communication. They can't talk to anybody. Oh, yeah, wait. Here's my SP to clear. <laughs> and for any Scientologists who might be watching this, on the back it says, her only terminal is the International Justice Chief via the Continental Justice Chief. The international justice chief, if they exist, in 12 years of me being out and speaking out, will not talk to me, will not call me, will not answer a letter, nothing, right? I've sat outside their HGB where the executives are, and the security have said, get off of our building. And I say, no, I can't talk to you. Only terminal, IJC. <laughs> Bring them out. But, you know, they, so, you know they, they're, they're, they say they're the most ethical people on the planet, right? Okay, I'm going to give you a story of how ethical they are. I did a talk with uh, Professor Stephen Kent at a college, and this minister had set it up, who's a critic, someone who was never in Scientology but speaking out against the abuses, pre-anonymous, Right? Okay, so we talk about, it was right after 9-11, we talk about fair game, different abuses, at the end, and I had said, they're going to get in, and he said, oh, no, no, this is invitation only. So I walk into the college, and his hair is like all spiked out, I said, what happened? He said, they're here. I said, I told you. So at the end, Gail Carroll, I think is her name, goes, I think we should just forget all of this, the world is in such a bad shape, I really think we should just take care of, you know, positive things. And they all, they're ministers, so they all kind of feel bad. That's it. Would have been the end of it, except Scientology, and this is the good thing about Scientology, they always prove what we talk about. Right? Is it true? Every time we pick it, they were out today, you know, they, they just prove what we're talking about. So we walk outside, kind of bummed, and who's there? the Office of Special Affairs, passing out literature against Stephen Kent. And the ministers freak out, right? And they circle us and get us to our cars, right? Okay, bad enough. But now the minister calls me up and he goes, okay, they want a special meeting with me. I knew it was to handle him, right? And I said, look, they're liars. They're going to lie through their teeth. They're going to say you never did Scientology, so you don't know what you're talking about. And he goes, okay, will you come? And I said, I will. And I thought, let's see, what should I bring? My SP to clear. I'm not really thinking of it at the time. I, you know, I thought, eh, it'll be something good. So I walk in, and the biggest minister there gives me this really dirty look, which most Scientologists do all the time anyway. 
And if you're a Scientologist, you're supposed to be able to communicate with anyone freely at any time. So that's grade zero, first thing, flunk. So, <laughs> I love to use their tech against them, I do. And that's oppressive, yes. I'm such an SP, and they made me one, too. I wasn't really. I was a nice person until I got in Scientology. <laughs> okay, so I go to the meeting. He gives me this really dirty look, and I said, okay, cool. So we sit down. They have 13 minutes to talk, and he has 13 minutes to talk. That's it. They can't talk ever about Scientology because they might misrepresent L. Ron Hubbard. So they have to read what L. Ron Hubbard said. So they read the creed of a Scientologist, man has the inalienable right of free speech and free thought, right? And the on and on and on. They go on and on. And I'm like, okay, I got it. And he goes into the net nanny, suicides, you know, just the awful breaking up of families, you know, just one thing after another. And it was Gail Carroll, um, Moxon's partner, I forget what his name is, his old partner. Yeah. He was there, which, what church brings an attorney to a meeting with a minister? It was a bunch of ministers and this critic minister. So Tim Bowles, her, and some other hotshot, right? And me, and this guy, and Jeff Jacobson came too. So we're sitting there, he, ta he brings up all these abuses, and one by one they go, well, I don't know anything about that. Do you know anything about that, Tim? And I knew these people personally. I knew they knew that these things, you know what I mean? They knew everything. The net nanny, where they put it on our computers so we couldn't see the dark side of Scientology. They lied through their teeth, just like I said. So it ends. And he looks like a knucklehead, right? He's a pinhead. You know, he, not really. He's a really cool guy. But they're kind of like real smug, like, we got him. And I said, okay, so uh, could I just ask a question? And the guy says, yeah, go ahead, ask the question. Still kind of snotty to me, and I said, okay, if your creed, which you just read, maybe I can talk here, it says, man has an inalienable right to free speech and free thought. Why can't any of my 30-year friends talk to me or my husband of 27 years? Right? And she says, well, he kind of looks at her like this, and, and she says, well, I said, you declare people suppressive, and that's why they can't talk to me. And she says, well, that's an exaggeration. I mean, we only declare 2.5% of the people. And remember, it's a whole room like this of ministers. And she goes, Hitler was an SP, and Tory is an SP. <laughs> <laughs> And they, and I'm like, bingo, man, you just nailed it. I mean, it was like, that. you couldn't have a worse example of, you know, I'm like Donna Reed, you know what I mean? They're looking like, huh, Hitler and her? <laughs> you know, didn't really fly. And I'm just like, oh, baby. And so I said, I could tell that that pretty much nailed it. But then I thought, would you all like to see my suppressive declarity? He goes like this to her. You don't put it in writing, do you? And she and she's just kind of like shrinking away. And I, and I said, Oh yeah, they do. Here it is. Let me pass it around, right? And that was it. That was the end of the party. Game over. Done, right? And that's the Church of Scientology. I mean, they're liars. I mean, they lie through their teeth. These are the executives lying through their teeth. So anyway, ethical people on the planet. The tricky thing is. Most, a lot of the people that are in the church are very, very brainwashed and are nice people. So unfortunately, a lot of people in the society have a neighbor or a hairdresser or whatever that's a Scientologist. So if you start talking about really evil, how bad they are, they kind of think of that person and go, well, they're not that bad. But I always say the people aren't that bad. It's the guys that run it that are running the show, and then they're like, ooh. And the other thing I do is I carry a business card around all the time, wherever I am. If I go to a restaurant and there's some pretty girl, I live in LA, so I go, you know what, your life's in danger. And they go, really? Why? And I go, Church of Scientology. 
You're pretty. They're after you, man. You're young. You make great staff. Here's my card. That's all I say. Here's my card. Here's what they won't tell you. Go look on it. Learn both sides. Make up your own mind. But don't not know what, because they, you know, they're very good at that kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. So now let me check if I covered everything. Okay, so they run these dead agent things, right, on people like you and you and me now, Jerry. When I was in, they, they said horrible things about Jerry. Arnie, you know, people that were like these big spokespeople from a long, long time ago that have had courage to stand up when, you know, like all of us and everybody now has the luxury of A, the internet, B, critics, even before anonymous, C, anonymous, right? Which totally was a game changer forever, and it was. We all know that. And, but, it would, but anonymous wouldn't be around if it wasn't for the critics before them, the ex-Scientologists, the early, early people that, I mean, some of the stories, I'm sure if you sat and talked to Jerry, I mean, the pain of leaving all by yourself. I mean, imagine this man by himself. All alone. I mean, you guys have, look at all the people we have, how wonderful that is. It's fantastic. There's no way Scientology can win on this anymore. It's over. You know, I, I, when I realized it was over was a couple of years ago I was working, and this guy sent me a message, an email, and he said, I'm part of Anonymous. And it was about 200 people that worked there, and I said, really? Where, where do you work? And he said, IT. And I said, oh, okay, I'll come over and meet you. So I, and I know anonymous will say, well, then he's not anonymous. But anyway, he, you know, he, was, he was doing his own thing. So I go over there, and I said, how'd you get into this? And he goes, South Park, right? <laughs> and he laughed, right? And I said, okay, cool. And I said, but have you seen the unfunny truth about Scientology? Because this is a big deal for me. I know seven kids have killed themselves. I know very, very many of my very dear friends who've died in their 30s who were Scientologists. So, you know, it's, it's a bad news deal. It's a big deal to me that people understand that side of it too, as well as the funny side of Xenu and all the rest. And he said, oh, that's my job. And I said, that's your job? What are you, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, maybe you don't know it, but every time that video goes up, Scientology takes it down. And he goes, but... I got it right here. And <laughs> it was on a two gig thing. And he said, I just pop it in. He said, I'm in IT. So all day long, I just pop it in, put it back up on the net. <laughs> and I don't know that guy's name. If he hears this, keep doing it. <laughs> but that's the incredible thing. I mean, I can't say it enough to every critic, to every anonymous person. To every ex Scientologist, to the independents, to anybody, anybody who's helping expose the abuses of the Church of Scientology, it is fantastic. Because it doesn't matter. People go, oh, I don't, I, I'm only doing this. Every little bit of your only doing this adds up to this. You see what I mean? And it's huge. It's huge. And this is going to be even better because it's on the internet, right? So tons of people that, couldn't originally come here, we'll be able to see it and learn from all the people that spoke. So then you guys know the story of the top secret mafia, right? So I'm just going to say their three goals, they got me opening up these accounts on the internet. Did you know about them? You look like you don't. You in the back, the lady. <laughs> you frowning and looking at me. You, do, you, know about the top, you know about the top secret mafia? You do? Okay. All right, so anybody who does it, in case you're watching on the video, OSA International, which is part of the Church of Scientology, my best friend got me to open up these accounts to handle the critics. This was pre-anonymous in the 90s. And they were anonymous accounts, and it was just like, you know, just open them up, we're, gonna, we're handling the critics. And I said, well, what are you doing with them? And he said, I'm not going to tell you, because if I tell you, then they'll be able to depose you, and they're really evil at that. I said, okay. But then they started acting really mafia-like, so I finally went and looked on the internet, saw that they were basically stopping free speech. And I am a free speech advocate, and I was like, I can't do this. 
And so I called up my friend who got me into it, Bill Yachty, and said, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I've got to go back to work. So he said, okay, no problem. Just come on by this apartment and uh, debrief, you know, tell us what happened. So I think, okay, no big deal. So I go to the apartment. It's all men. They're all OT7s and 8s, which is the top guys in the pyramid. And uh, it's awful. You know, it's very dark, very dim. I think this is really weird. And I'm kind of, I'm the only girl. And all of a sudden, bam, the door slams. In comes Gavino. I told you about her. I warned you about her. To my friend, my auditor, my counselor, who should have my back, right? Did he? Hell no. And they grilled me for like two hours long, just pounding, pounding, pounding. And I finally just burst out crying, ran out the door. He came flying out after me because I know at that second, that was the second I left the Church of Scientology. It took me another six months probably to actually wake up and leave. But that was the second I went, I am done with this shit. I had had enough. And one other thing I want to add is the World Institute of Scientology Enterprises Wise. If you have anything to do with business, do not get connected up with these people. I'm going to tell you. Can I tell two quick stories? Okay, one, this lady called me from the Midwest in the United States and said, she was crying. I said, what happened? She said, we got a flyer in the Midwest. Come here for the management technology. They flew to Florida. They did one interview with her. She'd been married 17 years. They did eight interviews. What do you think about Scientology? She said, I don't want to do it. I don't like it. I don't like Scientology. I'm here for the management tech. Eight interviews later with her husband. This is in a weekend by Sunday night. They said, either you're a Scientologist. He came out and said, either you join Scientology or we're done. So I always mention why is because... That's the money. Miscavige came in when we were on seven and said, forget it. This party's over. You know, you guys are going to change how you look. You're going to change how you act because we're after the doctors, the dentists, the physical therapists, the chiropractors, because that's the money, right? It was pretty weird for us. But anyway, I could talk on forever. But I told you that. Oh, yeah, the other story I wanted to tell you was the kids that escaped out. Recently, these two kids called me in one week. One of them's shaking. He's in Florida. And he goes, I saw your videos. I want to leave. I'm in the Sea Org. I want to leave. And I said, okay, who do you know? Who can you call? He didn't know anybody. Typical Scientologist who'd been cut off of everything, right? So I said, okay, how old are you? And he said, I'm 21. And I said, well, I'm just going to give you my advice, what I would do. And he said, okay, what? And I said, start walking, man. (laughs) I said, it's a beautiful country. You will start remembering people you know, it'll work out, people will help you. And he called me two days later, I'm on my way! (laughs) So that was really cool. And for me, I can't thank enough everyone around the world who has helped me, because I I don't know that I'd be alive, I really don't, without the help, and I know Jerry feels the same, and all of us, you know, it's just incredible, every little thing helps. So the second one, in the same week, was another kid who called me from Las Vegas, and he's freaked out, and he's like, left the Sea Org, want to go, but I've got to go back in. I said, don't go back in. Who do you know? And he goes, I only know my dad, but I haven't talked to him in 10 years. I said, call him. So he calls his dad. By the time he gets, his dad calls a friend in Vegas for him to go to. This is such a great thing. He, the Sea Org follows him. They've already figured out where he is. They follow him to the, where, the, where this house is, thinking they're going to get the kid. The guy comes to the door with a shotgun and a knife. It says, he's a Christian. He says, get off my lawn. You're from the devil. <laughs> so anyway, I love you guys. I thank you all. I, it's just an honor, really, to be with you guys. Thank you. And uh, continue. Yeah.